When corrupt cops cross the line, their journey takes an unexpected turn towards prison. In this exploration, we will unravel the story of what unfolds once these officers, who were meant to enforce the law, become the ones incarcerated. Join us as we discover the consequences that await corrupt cops who end up behind bars, shedding light on their fate within the criminal justice system. Michael Slager. On April 4th, 2015, in North Charleston, South Carolina, the routine act of a police officer pulling over a motorist for a non-functioning brake light escalated into a tragic encounter that would send shockwaves throughout the United States. Walter Scott, a 50-year-old black man, was fatally shot by Michael Slager, a local police officer, during this seemingly ordinary traffic stop. Walter Lamar Scott, the victim of this tragic incident, was a forklift operator who aspired to study massage therapy. Despite his goals, Scott had a troubled history, including issues with child support payments that had previously led to his incarceration. He had also served two years in the U.S. Coast Guard before receiving a general discharge in 1986 due to a drug-related offense. Michael Thomas Slager, on the other hand, was the police officer who stopped Scott. At 33 years old, Slager had served for over five years in the North Charleston Police Department, NCPD. Before his career in law enforcement, he had served in the U.S. Coast Guard. However, Slager's time in the police force was marked by controversy, including allegations of using a taser without cause in previous cases. He had been cleared of wrongdoing in these incidents. The tragic incident between Slager and Walter occurred at 9.30 a.m. in the parking lot of an auto parts store on Remount Road. Officer Slager initiated a traffic stop, pulling over Scott's 1991 Mercedes for a non-functioning third brake light. Scott, who was driving to the auto parts store, was compliant during the initial interaction. However, what transpired next would change the course of events dramatically. For reasons still unclear, Scott exited his vehicle and fled on foot. Slager pursued him, and the encounter quickly escalated. The dash cam in Slager's patrol car captured the initial exchange and showed Slager returning to his vehicle. Scott continued to flee, leading to a physical altercation between the two men. During the struggle, Slager deployed his taser striking Scott. Despite the taser, Scott attempted to escape. It was at this point that Slager drew his point .45 caliber Glock 21 handgun and fired eight rounds at Scott. Tragically, Scott was struck multiple times, including three shots in the back, once in the upper buttocks and once in the ear. Forensic analysis later revealed that the fatal shot entered Scott's back, puncturing his lungs and heart. Slager immediately radioed a dispatcher reporting, shots fired and the subject is down. He grabbed my taser. Slager, in his initial report, claimed he had shot Scott because he felt threatened and believed Scott had taken his taser. However, an eyewitness video would soon challenge this narrative. Faden Santana, an eyewitness to the shooting, recorded the incident on his smartphone. Initially hesitant to share the video due to fear of reprisals, Santana decided to come forward when he realized the police report did not align with what he had witnessed. In an interview, Santana explained, I felt that my life with this information might be in danger. I thought about erasing the video and just getting out of the community, you know, Charleston, and living someplace else. Santana shared the video first with Walter Scott's family through a Black Lives Matter activist and later with the news media. Santana's video became a crucial piece of evidence, contradicting Slager's account. The footage clearly showed Scott being shot from behind as he attempted to flee. After being struck by the bullets, Scott fell to the ground. Slager then approached Scott, handcuffed him, and left him face down on the ground. Importantly, despite police reports claiming officers had performed CPR on Scott, the video did not show any such action. The video also captured Slager returning to the area where the initial struggle had occurred, picking up an object, possibly the taser, and dropping it beside Scott's body. In the aftermath of the tragic shooting of Walter Scott, several significant developments unfolded. A toxicology report conducted after Scott's death detected the presence of cocaine and alcohol in his system. However, the levels of cocaine were less than half the typical amount found in impaired drivers, and notably, alcohol was absent. Criticism was directed at Clarence W. Habersham Jr., the second officer seen in the video, with calls for his prosecution and allegations of an attempted cover-up. Questions arose regarding the accuracy of Habersham's report, especially given the video evidence showing minimal attempts to aid Scott after the shooting. Additionally, Michael Slager's original defense attorney, David Ayler, withdrew from the case shortly after the video's release, citing attorney-client privilege without providing a public explanation. Slager faced termination from the North Charleston Police Department, NCPD, on April 8, 2015. Although the city continued to cover his health insurance expenses due to his wife's pregnancy, his wife later faced substantial harassment and death threats. A GoFundMe campaign aimed at financing Slager's defense sparked controversy as the platform swiftly shut it down, citing privacy concerns and violations of its terms and conditions. Finally, Walter Scott's funeral, a poignant moment, was held on April 11, 2015 at the Word Ministries Christian Center in Somerville, South Carolina, is located approximately 20 miles from North Charleston. The tragic killing of Walter Scott had far-reaching implications that resonated on multiple fronts. It played a pivotal role in igniting the ongoing national conversation on race and policing, becoming closely linked to other contentious police shootings of black 
black individuals across the United States. This, in turn, sparked a wave of protests and demonstrations led by the Black Lives Matter movement, underscoring the urgent need for reform and accountability within law enforcement agencies. In response to the incident, legislative action was taken as South Carolina introduced a bill aimed at equipping more police officers with body cameras. The bill was not just any legislation. It was renamed in honor of Walter Scott, symbolizing a commitment to prevent such tragedies from recurring. To support this initiative, the state Senate allocated $3.4 million in funding, which would facilitate the purchase of 2,000 body cameras for South Carolina's law enforcement officers. Furthermore, the impact of Walter Scott's killing extended to the realm of documentary filmmaking. In May 2016, a documentary titled Frame 394 was released by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. The investigation and prosecution of Michael Slager following the tragic shooting of Walter Scott underwent a thorough and complex process. Multiple agencies conducted investigations into the incident, reflecting its significance. The FBI, alongside the U.S. Attorney for the District of South Carolina, delved into the case, seeking to uncover the truth behind the fatal shooting. Simultaneously, the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division scrutinized the situation for any potential violations of civil rights, emphasizing the importance of accountability. Independently, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, SLED, carried out its own investigation into the shooting, contributing to the comprehensive examination of the circumstances surrounding Walter Scott's death. An autopsy performed by the Charleston County Coroner confirmed that Scott had sustained multiple gunshot wounds in his back, leading to the classification of his death as a homicide and intensifying the scrutiny on the case. The legal proceedings against Michael Slager unfolded in a series of consequential steps. Initially, Slager was arrested on April 7 and charged with murder after video evidence raised critical questions about the shooting. Subsequently, a South Carolina grand jury indicted him on the murder charge on June 8, with this being the sole charge presented for their consideration. Following almost nine months in custody without bail, Slager was released on $500,000 bond on January 4, 2016, albeit with the requirement of house arrest until the trial's commencement on October 31, 2016. However, the trial ended in a mistrial on December 5, 2016, as the jury reached an impasse, with 11 of the 12 jurors favoring a conviction. A new legal chapter began when Slager faced federal charges and was indicted on May 11, 2016. These charges encompassed violations of Walter Scott's civil rights, the unlawful use of a weapon during the commission of a crime, and obstruction of justice for providing statements that contradicted the video evidence. Initially pleading not guilty, Slager entered a guilty plea on May 2, 2017, specifically admitting to the charge of deprivation of rights under color of law. In exchange for his guilty plea, the charges of obstructing justice and using a firearm during a crime of violence were dismissed. The culmination of this legal journey arrived on December 7, 2017, as U.S. District Judge David C. Norton sentenced Michael Slager to 20 years in prison. The sentencing decision marked the conclusion of a contentious legal debate over whether the shooting constituted second-degree murder or manslaughter. Ultimately, Judge Norton classified it as second-degree murder, resulting in a substantial prison term for Slager. Given the absence of parole in the federal justice system, he was projected to serve approximately 18 years after considering his time served in jail. As of 2023, Michael Slager is incarcerated at the Englewood Federal Correctional Institution in Littleton, Colorado. He is identified as federal inmate hash 31,292-171. His access to his eight-and-a-half-month pregnant wife was limited to video calls, and there was always an officer stationed outside the booth when he communicated with his family. He was also banned from seeing his newborn child for a few months. Despite efforts to seek a reduction in his sentence, including claims of ineffective defense and lack of involvement in plea deal negotiations, Slager remains in custody, and his earliest possible release date is anticipated to be August 16, 2032. Slager is kept in isolation from the rest of the inmates due to concerns about his safety, as there are numerous agitated individuals, both from the black and white community, who are angry about what Slager did to Walter. Mohammed Noor. On July 15, 2017, tragedy struck in Minneapolis, Minnesota, when Justine Damon, a 40-year-old Australian-American woman, met a shocking and untimely demise. Justine Damon, born Justine Maya Damon on April 4, 1977, had her roots in the Northern Beaches area of Sydney, New South Wales. She pursued a career in veterinary medicine, graduating from the University of Sydney in 2002. However, her journey took an unexpected turn as she transitioned into the roles of spiritual healer and meditation coach. It was during this period of self-discovery that she crossed paths with Don Damon, a U.S. citizen, during a neuroscience workshop. Love blossomed, and the couple became engaged on December 29, 2014, with plans to marry in August 2017. In anticipation of their union, Justine adopted the Damon family name. Her dual Australian and United States citizenship reflected her family's international ties. In stark contrast to Damon's life, Mohammed Noor, the Minneapolis Police Department officer at the center of the incident, had a 
background marked by controversy and scrutiny. Born on October 20, 1985, in Coriolis, Somalia, Noor gained attention as one of the first Somali-American police officers in the Minneapolis area. Partnered with Matthew Harity, his colleague and driver of their squad car, Noor had been with the police department for just 21 months at the time of the incident, while Harity had one year of service under his belt. However, Noor's brief tenure as a police officer was marred by a troubling history. In the two years leading up to the tragic shooting, he had accumulated three formal complaints, with two unresolved as of September 2017. Additionally, a lawsuit filed in May 2017 alleged that he had assaulted a woman while on duty, casting further doubt on his fitness for the role. One aspect of Noor's background that raised eyebrows was the accelerated nature of his police training, referred to as a fast-tracked cadet. He had completed a seven-month training program designed for candidates with prior college degrees seeking entry into law enforcement. Despite the controversy surrounding his training, former police chief Janie Harteau defended the program, insisting that it produced well-prepared officers. She distanced the department from Noor's actions, asserting that they did not reflect the values or expectations of the entire force. Even before the tragic incident, there were concerns about Noor's mental fitness for police duty. In 2015, two psychiatrists and other training officers had reportedly expressed reservations about his suitability for the role. Furthermore, two months prior to the shooting, Noor was alleged to have pointed a gun at a driver during a routine traffic stop, raising serious questions about his judgment and demeanor as an officer. The fateful night of the shooting unfolded when Justine Damon placed two consecutive 911 calls at 11.27 p.m. and 11.35 p.m. Concerned about a possible assault she heard in the vicinity, she reported the distressing sounds to the authorities. Dispatch categorized the call as unknown trouble, female screaming, giving it a relatively low priority. In response, officers Noor and Harity arrived in the quiet neighborhood of Fulton, located in southwestern Minneapolis. They approached the scene with their police Ford Explorer's lights off, expecting to investigate the reported incident. However, upon arrival, they found no suspects or any signs of the alleged assault that had prompted Damon's calls. As the officers prepared to depart, Noor entered code 4 into the cruiser's computer, indicating that the scene was secure. It was then that a sudden loud noise startled Harity, and Damon, dressed in her pajamas, approached the driver's side window of the police car. Harity drew his weapon but kept it pointed downward, refraining from firing. In stark contrast, Noor discharged his firearm through the open window, tragically striking an unarmed and barefoot Damon in the abdomen. Despite the officer's attempts at cardiopulmonary resuscitation, Damon's life could not be saved, and she succumbed to her injuries 20 minutes later. Harity later confessed that both officers had been startled, while Noor justified his actions by claiming he believed his partner's life was in danger. The lack of body camera footage or audio recordings left crucial details shrouded in ambiguity, intensifying the public's demand for answers and accountability. A 16-year-old bicyclist's cell phone video of the scene after the shooting provided a glimpse into the aftermath, but could not fill the void left by the absence of critical evidence. The aftermath of Damon's tragic death sparked a wave of reactions both in the United States and abroad. In Minneapolis, a vigil in her memory was held at the site of her death, drawing mourners to the alleyway entrance where the tragedy had unfolded. A memorial service for Damon took place on August 11, 2017, at Lake Harriet in Minneapolis, attended by her family, fiancé, and around 1,000 mourners. In Australia, where Damon had deep roots, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull expressed the nation's shock and disbelief at the incident. He demanded answers on behalf of Damon's grieving family and the Australian public, characterizing her death as inexplicable and a tragic loss. The aftermath of Justine Damon's tragic shooting unfolded like a complex legal drama filled with investigations, trials, and appeals. The incident left the community and the nation searching for answers and justice. Immediately following the shooting, law enforcement initiated an investigation. A search warrant was sought to examine the alley where the tragic event occurred. The warrant mentioned that upon the police's arrival, Damon had interacted with the patrol squad, but what transpired next remained a mystery. Despite the uncertainty surrounding the exact sequence of events, it was a fact that Damon had tragically lost her life in that very alley. Investigators collected evidence, including fingerprints from the rear cargo door window of the squad car. In a controversial move just hours after the shooting, the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension obtained a second search warrant, this time to search Damon's home. They were in search of evidence that could shed light on the circumstances surrounding her death. This included looking for bodily fluids, controlled substances, and writings. However, nothing was taken from the property. Meanwhile, Mohammed Noor, one of the involved officers, chose to exercise his right against self-incrimination and declined to speak with investigators. Both Noor and his partner, Harity, were placed on paid administrative leave during the investigation. Minneapolis Chief of Police Janie Harteau was absent on vacation leave when Damon's killing occurred. She returned to Minneapolis four days later and expressed her deep regret, stating, Justine didn't have to die. The death of Justine should not have happened. Harteau also commented on Noor's refusal to cooperate with investigators, expressing 
her preference for him to speak. As the investigation progressed, a grand jury was convened in February 2018 to examine the circumstances of Damon's death. Officer Harity appeared before the grand jury, contributing to the ongoing inquiry. Subsequently, on March 20th, 2018, a warrant was issued for Noor's arrest, charging him with third-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter. He turned himself into the police and, notably, resigned from the Minneapolis Police Department. Bail was set at $400,000 and Noor was released from jail on March 22nd. Prosecutors later sought to upgrade the charges against him to second-degree intentional murder. The legal battle culminated in a high-stakes jury trial that began on April 30th, 2019. Noor faced charges of third-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter. Under Minnesota law, third-degree murder was defined as causing the death of another through an act dangerous to others without intent to kill. Second-degree manslaughter was described as causing death through culpable negligence. The verdict was eagerly anticipated, and on that day, Noor was convicted of third-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter. Subsequently, his bail was revoked, and he was taken into custody to await sentencing. In the wake of the conviction, the Somali-American Police Association issued a statement alleging that racial bias had played a role in Noor's conviction. On June 7, 2019, Noor was sentenced to 12 and a half years in prison. Initially, he was incarcerated at Oak Park Heights Prison, but for his safety, he was transferred out of state to North Dakota State Penitentiary in Bismarck in July 2019. However, the legal journey did not end there. Noor pursued an appeal of his conviction. On February 1, 2021, he upheld his conviction for third-degree murder. Noor subsequently appealed to the Minnesota Supreme Court, arguing that the facts did not support a conviction on that charge. In a significant turn of events, on September 15, 2021, the Minnesota Supreme Court reversed Noor's third-degree murder conviction. They reasoned that the state had failed to prove that he had committed murder with a depraved mind, a requirement for third-degree murder. Instead, the Supreme Court directed the trial court to vacate the third-degree murder conviction and sentence Noor for the lesser offense of second-degree manslaughter. This led to a remand, resentencing, and eventual release. During an October 2021 proceeding, the trial court resentenced Noor to 57 months in prison, the maximum presumptive sentence under Minnesota's sentencing guidelines. On June 27, 2022, Noor was released from the North Dakota State Penitentiary after serving two-thirds of his sentence incarcerated. The remaining 19 months of his sentence were to be served on supervised release. Noor's release generated mixed reactions, with Damon's family expressing disappointment in what they deemed a trivial and disrespectful incarceration duration, given the community's expectations for reform in police behavior and culture. Kim Potter. On April 11, 2021, a tragic incident unfolded in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, when Dante Wright, a 20-year-old black American man, lost his life during a traffic stop and arrest attempt. The shooting, carried out by police officer Kimberly Potter, sparked outrage, protest, and discussions about police reform across the United States. Dante Wright was a young man trying to make a life for himself. He had recently moved to Minneapolis from Chicago, where he played basketball in high school. Due to a learning disability, he had to drop out of school, but he worked in various jobs to support his young son. Kimberly Potter, on the other hand, was a veteran police officer with over two decades of service in the Brooklyn Center Police Department. She had just finished training a new officer when the incident occurred. Potter was known for her experience, but would soon find herself at the center of a tragic mistake. The incident began as a routine traffic stop when Wright, accompanied by his girlfriend, was pulled over for a minor traffic violation. During the stop, it was discovered that Wright had an outstanding warrant. Officers decided to arrest him as they attempted to handcuff him. A struggle ensued. At this point, Officer Potter, who had intended to use her taser, mistakenly drew her firearm and shot Wright in the chest. It was a horrifying mistake with fatal consequences. Wright, wounded and in shock, managed to drive a short distance before colliding with another vehicle. Officers rushed to the scene, administered CPR, and called for paramedics. Despite their efforts, Wright could not be revived and was pronounced dead shortly after. The incident triggered an immediate response. Brooklyn Center's police chief, Tim Gannon, held a press conference admitting the grave error. Potter and Gannon both resigned from their positions shortly afterward, and the community demanded justice. Investigations were launched by the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and the Washington County Attorney's Office. Potter faced criminal charges, initially second-degree manslaughter, and later first-degree manslaughter. The legal proceedings would determine her fate and hold her accountable for her actions. This tragic event had far-reaching consequences. It led to protests, calls for police reform, and changes in policing policies not only in Brooklyn Center, but also in other parts of the United States. Dante Wright's life was cut short, but his legacy sparked a broader conversation about the need for change in law enforcement. Amid a backdrop of nationwide reckoning over racial injustice and police brutality ignited by the tragic killing of George Floyd in May 2020. Another grim incident unfolded in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota on April 11, 2021. Dante Wright, an unarmed black man, lost his life at the hands of the police. This event reignited the flames of protest and amplified the call for accountability and police reform. Following Dante Wright's fatal shooting,
shooting. Mourners and demonstrators gathered near the site of the tragedy, demanding justice. Some protesters had previously attended a rally against police violence in nearby St. Paul. As tensions escalated, law enforcement in riot gear confronted the crowd, deploying tear gas and non-lethal ammunition. Reports of looting, property damage, and vandalized police vehicles added to the chaos. The situation led to a curfew imposed by Mayor Mike Elliott, and the National Guard was deployed. Protests and civil unrest continued not only in Brooklyn Center, but also across the Minneapolis-St. Paul metropolitan area and other U.S. cities. Demonstrators used air fresheners as symbols of injustice, referencing one of the reasons cited by the police for stopping Wright's vehicle. Their demands included charging Kimberly Potter, the officer responsible for the murder, conducting an independent investigation, and implementing police reform measures. Public officials, including Mayor Elliott and Governor Tim Waltz, expressed their condolences and acknowledged the systemic issue of unarmed black men being killed by the police. President Joe Biden called for peaceful protests but condemned violence, emphasizing the need to listen to Dante Wright's family. The jury selection for Kimberly Potter's trial occurred from November 30th to December 3rd. Among the jurors, nine were white, reflecting the county's demographics. One was black and two were Asian, with an equal gender split. The trial began with opening statements on December 8th. During the trial, the prosecution argued that Potter mishandled her taser and fired her gun recklessly. The defense contended that Dante Wright resisted arrest, leading to a slip and capture error. Expert witnesses for the defense testified that Potter had the authority to use either her taser or firearm. Potter herself testified, admitting to mistakenly using her gun instead of her taser. She emphasized that she did not observe Wright with a weapon, and he was not violent during the arrest. Closing arguments were presented on December 20th, followed by jury deliberations. After deliberating for 27 hours over four days, the jury found Potter guilty of first-degree manslaughter and second-degree manslaughter on December 23rd. She was taken into custody and transferred to the Women's Correctional Facility in Shakopee. Potter's sentencing hearing took place on February 18th, 2022. Victim impact statements were given by Wright's mother, father, two siblings, and the mother of his child. Wright's mother expressed her inability to forgive Potter for not even uttering her son's name during the incident. Potter, in her statement, apologized to Wright's family and the Brooklyn Center community, stating that Wright was always in her thoughts. Potter was sentenced to two years in prison with 16 months to be served and eight months of supervised release. This sentence was shorter than typical for first-degree manslaughter in Minnesota. In late 2022, the Minnesota Board of Pardons declined to consider Potter's application for clemency. On April 24, 2023, Potter was released from prison after serving 16 months of her two-year sentence. She will remain on supervised release until December 2023. Wright's family hired civil rights attorney Benjamin Crump, and they received a $3.25 million settlement from the city of Brooklyn Center in mid-2020. This settlement included provisions for changes in policing policies, improved officer training, and the creation of a permanent memorial for Wright. Additionally, Elena Albrecht Payton, the passenger in Wright's vehicle during the incident, filed a civil lawsuit against the city, settling for $350,000 in early 2023. The release of Kimberly Potter, after serving 16 months of her two-year sentence, stirred anger and frustration within the black and white community and supporters of justice reform. Many saw her comparatively lenient sentence as a reminder of the broader issues of police accountability and racial disparities in the criminal justice system. Johannes Maserle. In the early hours of New Year's Day 2009, a tragic and deeply unsettling incident unfolded at the Fruitvale BART station in Oakland, California. At the heart of this story was Oscar Grant III, a 22-year-old African-American man with hopes, dreams, and a life tragically cut short. The chain of events began as a BART, Bay Area Rapid Transit train, carrying passengers who had been celebrating in San Francisco on New Year's Eve, was disrupted by reports of a heated alternative altercation on board. Oscar Grant and his friends were among those returning from the city, seeking to welcome the new year. However, their journey took an unimaginable turn. As the train came to a halt at the Fruitvale BART station, officers Anthony Perone and Marisol Domenici from the BART police were the first to arrive on the scene. They swiftly began detaining passengers suspected of involvement in the altercation, with Perone resorting to excessive force, including kneeing Grant in the head and compelling him to the ground. Chaos continued to unfold as more officers, including Johannes Meserle, arrived at the station. Grant and his friends found themselves pinned to the platform, facing a situation that was rapidly spiraling out of control. Maserly, in a moment that would shock the world, attempted to handcuff Grant, but, thwarted by the positioning, resorted to drawing his pistol and firing a single fatal shot into Grant's back. The tragic events that unfolded on that fateful night were captured in a chilling detail by the mobile phones of bystanders. These videos, graphic and distressing, rapidly disseminated through media outlets and online platforms, serving as a powerful catalyst for public outrage and demands for justice. Despite being rushed to the hospital, Oscar Grant succumbed to his injuries, leaving behind a family shattered by grief and a community reeling from the profound loss.
us. In the aftermath of this incident, Oakland and beyond experienced a tumultuous response. There were peaceful protests against the injustice, but as night fell, anger gave way to unrest, leading to looting, arson, destruction of property, and sporadic riots. Nearly 80 individuals were eventually arrested. Following the shooting, Johannes Meserle underwent drug and alcohol testing, which came back negative. He opted to remain silent and invoked his rights, refusing to cooperate with authorities out of concern for potential self-incrimination. Eventually, he resigned from the BART police force amid an internal investigation. Meserle and his family faced a barrage of death threats after videos of the shooting circulated. To ensure their safety, they relocated multiple times. The intensity of the public's anger was palpable. Marisol Domenici, another officer involved, testified during the investigation. She was later terminated by BART, accused of being untruthful in her statements to investigators. However, she successfully appealed her firing and was reinstated with back pay. The shooting and the subsequent upheaval made headlines not only regionally, but also nationally and internationally. Videos of the incident spread rapidly online, causing outrage, protests, and even riots. The release of video evidence triggered protests that sometimes turned violent. Rioters caused extensive property damage, smashing windows, setting fires, and clashing with police. Public perception of the investigations into the incident was marked by skepticism and frustration. The tension escalated as protests continued. A pivotal moment occurred when protesters surrounded a police car, prompting the officer inside to flee. The vehicle was vandalized, and law enforcement responded with tear gas and rubber bullets. Police arrested numerous individuals during the riots, citing offenses such as inciting a riot, vandalism, assault on a police officer, and arson. The disturbances eventually subsided, but the impact lingered. The riots damaged the city's reputation and posed challenges to economic growth. Oakland officials expressed their disappointment with the unrest and emphasized the need for better communication between law enforcement and the community. In the legal proceedings surrounding Johannes Messerla, a series of significant events unfolded. Alameda County District Attorney Tom Orloff wasted no time and filed murder charges against Messerla on January 12, prompting an arrest warrant as Messerla had left the city. He was apprehended on January 13th at a friend's residence near Lake Tahoe, Nevada, citing death threats as the reason for his flight. Messerla waived extradition and was placed in protective custody at the Santa Rita Jail in Dublin, California, ultimately pleading not guilty during his arraignment on January 15th. The U.S. Justice Department initiated a civil rights investigation on July 9th, 2010, which was later closed without charges. Judge Morris Jacobson set bail at $3 million on January 30th, 2009, and with the support of the police union's fundraising efforts, Meserle posted bail a week later. District Attorney Tom Orloff declined to speculate on the degree of murder charges, but emphasized the evidence pointing to an unlawful killing by an intentional act, citing Meserle's refusal to explain himself as grounds for pursuing murder charges. Meserle enlisted the services of defense attorney Michael Raines, who argued that prosecuting him for murder could be challenging due to the generally favorable view of police officers by juries. During a bail hearing, Raines contended that Meserle mistakenly deployed his service weapon instead of his taser, believing Grant was reaching for a gun while maintaining that Grant had actively resisted arrest. The preliminary hearing involved arguments about Meserle's intent, with a BART officer testifying that Grant and his friends had not obeyed orders and had yelled profanities before the shooting. The trial was moved to downtown Los Angeles due to concerns about finding an impartial jury in Alameda County, culminating in a diverse jury consisting of eight women and four men. The defense argued that Meserle may have confused his gun with his taser, providing a potential defense, but experts debated the plausibility of this confusion. As the legal proceedings unfolded, a series of compelling testimonies and events emerged in court. Witnesses recounted Meserle's shocked admission of, oh, shit, I shot him, immediately after the shooting. Grant's former girlfriend, Sophina Mesa, provided a crucial phone call record that indicated Grant wasn't resisting arrest. Mesa had called Grant during the detainment, and he assured her, they're beating us up for no reason. Phone records showed these calls occurred just minutes before the tragic incident. Eyewitnesses who took the stand on June 15th emphasized that neither Grant nor the others had actively resisted the officers before the shooting. Their testimonies painted a disturbing picture of the officers' behavior leading up to the tragedy. A significant witness, Jackie Bryson, who was handcuffed and kneeling close to Grant during the shooting, testified that Grant had surrendered, uttering the words, I quit, I surrender. He claimed that Maserle callously muttered, F this, before firing the fatal shot. Bryson's credibility was challenged by the defense, who highlighted a video of him running away while handcuffed, citing stress and distrust of the police. On June 25th, Maserle himself took the stand, emotionally recounting that he hadn't realized he was holding his gun until he heard the gunshot. He tearfully recalled Grant saying, you shot me, immediately after the incident, prompting disruptions in the courtroom. The closing arguments on July 1st offered jurors three conviction options, including second-degree murder, voluntary manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter, or acquittal. Prosecutor Michael O'Brien argued that Maserly's actions inherently constituted a crime, leaving the 
jury to determine the degree. The defense, represented by attorney Michael Raines, asserted that the shooting was accidental, urging jurors not to make a broader statement about police community relations. Deliberations began on July 2nd with occasional interruptions, and a verdict was reached on July 8th. Johannes Messerle was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter, but acquitted of second-degree murder and voluntary manslaughter charges. Additionally, he was found guilty of a gun enhancement charge, potentially lengthening his prison sentence. Sentenced initially to two years with double credit for time served, reducing his term significantly, Maserla was released on June 13, 2011. Later in 2012, he appealed his conviction with the aim of returning to police work, but his appeals were ultimately denied by the California Supreme Court, marking the conclusion of a complex and highly scrutinized legal saga. Bart initially offered apologies to Grant's family, but later filed a legal response, arguing that the shooting was a tragic accident and that Grant had contributed to the incident. Bart faced public outrage, and community leaders called for accountability. Efforts to address the situation included hiring independent auditors to investigate Bart police misconduct and enforcing civilian oversight of the Bart Police Department. The investigation into other officers' involvement yielded inconclusive results, and an independent law firm conducted further inquiries, highlighting failures in police procedures and communication. Protests and public demonstrations erupted, with concerns of racial bias and injustice at the forefront. These protests eventually played a role in the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement. Some demonstrations turned violent, resulting in property damage and arrests, while Grant's family and community leaders appealed for calm. In the years that followed, the shooting of Oscar Grant continued to influence popular culture, with documentaries, songs, and films reflecting on the tragedy and its impact on society. Notably, the film Fruitvale Station portrayed the final 24 hours of Grant's life and won awards at the Sundance Film Festival. Grant's legacy remains a potent symbol of the ongoing fight against systemic discrimination and brutality and underscores the urgent need for police accountability and racial justice. This was all about the stories of the corrupt cops who ended up in jail. Thank you for staying with us. If you enjoy our content, our newest videos are just a click away.